Via telephone, Senator Charles Trump joins us. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning, Rob. I'm doing well, thank you. Charlie, is this a good month to have the last name Trump? Uh, well, I've always been happy to uh, have the name Trump, even before <laughs> uh, I knew of Donald. So uh, I, I suppose every month is a good a good month to have my last name. Are you related? Uh, no. Everyone asks that question. I know my Trump family tree for four or five generations, and it's all eastern panhandle of West Virginia. And before that, it runs back to uh, Manchester, Maryland. Uh, so if there is any relationship, it have to be uh, very, very distant. Do you know the year your family came to this country, Charlie? No, I, I do not. Uh, the... Um, you know, I know that my great grandfather was uh, came to Martinsburg. He was the first to come to the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia, and he was the rector, the minister at uh, St. John's Lutheran Church in Martinsburg. When when was that, Charles? Uh, late nineteenth century and into the early twentieth century. I think he died in uh, nineteen nineteen. You know, when I first got out of law school, Bill, in the mid-'80s, there were still some people around who remembered him. And, in fact, one girl, one gal who worked in the uh, county clerk's office who told me that he had married her and her husband. Um, but I never knew him. He, he died, uh, you know, 50 years before I was born, 40 years yeah, I, I'm, I'm got become interested very uh, quite recently. We have some Indian burial grounds on our property, and uh, and I'm trying to find who the Indians might be. Uh, we've all been told over the years they're migratory, uh, using this only for summer hunting and fishing. But the Tuscarora Indians moved here in 1713 and moved out in 1763, and they did it because of the pressure of the white colonists coming in. So. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Charlie, when will your last day as a state senator be? Well, it's uh, not exactly clear yet, but sometime next month, sometime in the month of December. What will the process be like to replace you? Uh, there's a statutory process. Um, so uh, the um, I'll be leaving in the middle of a four-year term of office to which I was elected in 2022. And so uh, the statute says that the uh, uh, executive committee for the political party to which I belonged uh, for the 15th senatorial district uh, will have to meet and uh, provide within 15 days, I think the law says, a list of three names to the governor, uh, who then has, I think, five days under uh, that statute to appoint someone to replace me. Uh, that all starts when I resign. Now, uh, Senator, there be uh, your district represents, I think, has three counties represented. Would that be nine names submitted to the governor or just three names? No, I think three names, but uh, the uh, you're right. There are three counties in the district now. There used to be four. We used to have part of Mineral County, but that went away after the last redistricting. So it's parts of Berkeley, Morgan, and Hampshire, and all Morgan, and all Hampshire County. And uh, the, the, the executive committee for that district, uh, I think, would be required to give the governor a list of three names total. Does the person, are, does the person have to be from Morgan County who replaces you, Charlie? No. Uh, the Constitution provides that where a, a Senate district contains m parts of more than one county, then no two senators can be chosen from the same county. So uh, because uh, Tom Willis, who will be joining the Senate by virtue of his election in November, is from Berkeley County, uh, the person who is appointed as my successor cannot be from Berkeley County. And it'll have to be somebody from Morgan or Hampshire County. 
Yeah, uh, I think you may have addressed this, but uh, our breakfast political round discussion the other day discussed this, and someone's trying to make the distinction between appointed and elected. I know with elected they cannot be from the same county, but does that hold true for appointment as well, Senator? Well, I I will say I think so, but um, you know I don't know that there's. Uh, has been a case where that question has been squarely presented, you know, to uh, the the court. But I think that's that's how it's operated. And I suspect it would operate this time as well. We were just kind of uh, skating to the edge of what might or might be uh, legally possible. It's Senator John Gilstrap, uh, your first day on the bench is when? Term of office starts January 1st, John. Okay, and when you, on that first day, there are going to be ongoing cases that have yet to be resolved. Do you get read in to those and then uh, take part in them, or do you just take part in new cases as as they go along? Uh, it's a great, great question. I, I will be read into those cases and participate in them. The court has its calendar already set for the January term, and uh, they have uh, stuff happening uh, not that first week of January, but uh, administrative conferences, uh, uh, case conferences, and oral arguments, all, I think, beginning in the second week of January. So for the so, – I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I am just going to say I'll, I'll be participating in all those. So for the cases that are ongoing that you're going to inherit, essentially, or move into, can you start – reading into those now or do you have to wait until you the term starts well and to the extent the the briefs in many of them are matters of public record so that clearly i can do anyone can uh there are some cases as you know probably that are sealed records cases involving allegations and decisions regarding child abuse and neglect, those records are sealed, uh, and I am not going to be permitted to read into those until I have taken an oath of office. Will you be the first Eastern Panhandle Supreme Court Justice, Charlie? Uh, since the late 19th century, there were two justices of the Supreme Court of Appeals who served uh, from Jefferson County in the uh, late 1800s. You'll be the first from Morgan County at least then, correct? Uh, first ever from Morgan County, yes, sir. And is the Supreme Court in West Virginia strictly an appellate court, or are you the first, I'm not sure what the, the right term is, the first stop for any level of cases at the Supreme Court? Well, the state now has an intermediate appellate court. So many cases, civil cases, and uh, uh, which get appealed from family courts and from circuit courts go to uh, the intermediate court of appeals, and appeals from that are to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has direct appeals in all criminal cases, all abuse and neglect cases, and the court has uh, original jurisdiction in extraordinary remedy cases, uh, mandamus, uh, writs of prohibition, uh, habeas corpus, uh, those those sorts of cases. Uh, Senator, there are five members of the Supreme Court. Uh, two members have either have stepped down or retired recently. So you would be one of those filling one of those unencumbered seats. Is that correct? Uh, there, it is correct to say that there are five members of the court. That's right. But two have not stepped down, just one. Okay. Uh, Justice Hutchison is uh, justice on the court from Beckley and uh, from Raleigh County. And he announced last year, his term is expiring at the end of this year, and he announced last year that he was not going to seek uh, re-election to a 12-year term uh, in 2024. Um, there, is a, a, there was another uh, seat the term of which expired, but it's not someone who is uh, stepping down. Justice Bunn was already on the court, and she announced that she was going to run for re-election, and she did run and uh, was re-elected to the Supreme Court of Appeals in May. When will your term expire, Charlie? Uh, the terms are 12 years.
So you go to twenty thirty six on the court. Yeah, yes. my term on the court. My term in the Senate would expire normally uh, at the end of twenty twenty six, but I'll be resigning it next month. Will you be supporting someone to replace you as a senator? Uh, no, I don't think that's appropriate. I, you know, and uh, it's 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 above my pay grade anyway. That's a decision ultimately that lies with the governor. And is there a need for a temporary replacement for you as the judiciary chair until the new Senate is sworn in? Uh, it, it depends. You know, if the, what will happen normally uh, is on January 8th, the Senate will organize and elect its officers for the uh, coming two years, a president, a clerk of the Senate, a doorkeeper, a sergeant at arms, and the president of the Senate at that point will appoint the members of the various committees and name uh, generally a chairman and a vice chairman for each committee. So, so your appointment, though, would be made by, a, by the governor. The question is, which governor? It could be Governor Justice. It could be Governor Marcy, or it could be an interim governor, Governor, governor Blair. Gr governor Blair. So it depends on the timing of, of this. Well, that's correct. Yeah. That's correct. What I understand, uh, Charlie, that if uh, if Senator, uh, sorry, if Governor Justice becomes Senator Justice ahead of the swearing-in dates in West Virginia, that it would be a need for the Lieutenant Governor Craig Blair to step in as Governor. Do you know how that process works? Uh, a little bit. Uh, the um, the term of office, I think for a United States senator commences on January 3rd. And so I think uh, Governor Justice could uh, take his oath of office on January 3rd and begin his uh, new duties as a United States senator from West Virginia. If he does that, um, it is prior to, not much, but 10 days or so prior to, the expiration of his current term of office and so as governor and the west virginia constitution provides that in the absence of the governor uh, the president of the senate uh, becomes the acting governor for the state of west virginia and that is as you have already mentioned craig blair so Senator Blair, of course, will be leaving the Senate as he lost his reelection bid. So that was Senate president. You were Senate Judiciary Chair. Uh, those are two pretty powerful positions that were held by Eastern Panhandle members of the delegation. Uh, that leadership void vacated with the exits of both you and uh, and Senator Blair. In regards to the Eastern Panhandle, then, uh, are you concerned about representation for the area with your absence? And Senator Blair's absence. Uh, well, I, th you know, I think Craig Clay, Craig Blair will will clearly be missed. I think he's done a good job as president of the Senate, but um, I have high expectations for Tom Willis, uh, who uh, is going to be the next senator in that seat. I think Tom is certainly uh, equipped to do a good job, and I, you know, I think I hope the governor. Uh, whoever it is that makes the appointment for my successor will choose someone uh, who will uh, represent well the interests of the uh, citizens of the Eastern Panhandle and uh, do a good job. So, uh, no, I'm not terribly concerned uh, about that. I think the uh, district and the Eastern Panhandle are going to be okay. Let, let me throw a complicating something uh, factor in. I just thought about it. Uh, Craig is not going to be part of the Senate as of what date? First of January or or eighth of the January? The swearing in date, which is swearing in is what date? Yeah. So uh, the Constitution provides that legislative uh, terms of office begin in December, but. You raise a really interesting yeah. question, Bill, and uh, it doesn't require a whole lot of conjecture because there was a case. There was a case in 1984, um, and in 1984, Warren McGraw had been uh, the president of the West Virginia Senate, and uh, I don't know if you remember 1984, but that was the year uh, that Jay Rockefeller was finishing his two terms as governor of West Virginia, 
and he had been elected in uh, in November that year to succeed Jennings Randolph as United States Senator for West Virginia. And the question came up because War McGraw, who had been and was president of the Senate, had not run for re-election to the Senate. And so he, just like Craig Blair, was going to be leaving the Senate. And the Supreme Court issued an opinion uh, in, in a case that very year uh, addressing the question and held, essentially, that the presidency of the Senate continues – uh, even beyond the term of office of the person occupying that, the senatorial term of the office, until the Senate reorganizes and elects a new president. So even though Craig Blair may not be in the Senate, he, may, he will still, under that decision, could be president of the Senate and acting governor of West Virginia. And taking this one step farther, when does the Senate – uh, typically reorganized. What I'm getting second, at, I'm sorry, go second, ahead. Second Wednesday of January, which in 2025 will be, I believe, the 8th. The 8th. So it's possible, this is possible, that we could have four governors within a period of uh, 10 days. Uh, I think you've made a true statement. Yeah. Or at I, least you two governors and two acting governors. Exactly right, exactly, two acting yeah. governors, yeah. That's pretty fascinating. Yeah. And it's possible that you'll have, after having no governors from the Eastern Panhandle, too, within a five-day period. Right? Well, that, That's right. That is possible. Yeah. Right? That's a, kind of fascinating. Charlie, what issues will the Senate be wrestling with going forward uh, that you as Judiciary Chair knew were still on the table had you still been in the Senate come January? Oh, there there are a number. Uh, of those, and of course, every year with the legislature is uh, the budget, of course, um, and the, um, the the legislature has uh, in in twenty twenty four this year enacted some f a, f a slight further reduction in income tax. So I think the um, the budget is going to require uh, close scrutiny to make sure that uh, the state. Uh, has the revenues it has for the operation of government. Uh, two years ago, we passed legislation sort of dismantling the DHHR and breaking it into smaller agencies, component, what were component parts of DHHR. And I think there will certainly be legislation addressing uh, that and uh, honing uh, the operation of that executive branch department I'm sure there will be further legislation addressing, you know, our state's uh, drug problem, opioid problem, uh, situations involving uh, the abuse and neglect and care of children. Uh, those are recurring, recurring uh, issues that come up uh, every year with multiple bills for the legislature to consider. Like and and that list is not exhausted. Mm -hmm. By the way, there are, you know many things. I'm sure the 2025 regular session legislature will be uh, like every other in that there will be literally thousands of bills that are introduced, and uh, some will get considered, many will not, and and that process uh, is in, in no small part going to be. Uh, the outcome of that will be determined by uh, the leadership for the Senate and the House that are elected in January. Is it preferred that the next judiciary chair be an attorney, or is that not specifically necessary? There's no rule that requires that. That's been the tradition in uh, both the House and the Senate, with very few exceptions, although I believe there have been exceptions over the history of the state. Is it helpful? To have a law degree if you are the judiciary chair, or is that just more of a convenience for the job? Well, Rob, it, it probably depends on whom you ask the question. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I, I think I'll say this. For me personally, it's been helpful to me. My training in the law, I think, has helped me um, uh, navigate the duties uh, of the office of chairman of the Judiciary Committee uh, that uh, – in, in ways that uh, maybe it might have been more of a challenge had I not been trained and had experience as an attorney. Uh, so, but 
I'm not sure everyone would share that opinion. Charles, we're about to run out of time, but I want to be sure I make this comment. Uh, you're going to be missed in the, uh, uh, in the area. Uh, you're going to be missed in the Senate. However, your wife, your wonderful wife, is going to be missed in a lot of functions as well. I'm thinking specifically of, of the hospice board, of which she's been one of the more valuable, valuable participants, members. So. Well, you're very kind to say that. Hospice, uh, the panhandle, is uh, near and dear to both our hearts, and uh, it's a wonderful organization. And uh, as you mentioned, Bill, Susan Susan has been, I don't know how long in total on that board, but and has loved every minute of it and, uh, you know, loved the, the people uh, with, with whom she's been able to work there. Uh, so I, I really appreciate your kind words. And But you're not going to miss me too much. I'm going to be around. My home is still going to be Morgan County. Uh, I'll be spending more time in Charleston, to be sure, but I am going to remain a resident of Berkeley Springs. Well, we certainly hope so. And, again, going back to Susan, she was one of the more effective members of the, of the board. So. Well, thank you for saying that. John? <clears throat> I have, I, I'm going to go back to politics. It, after, after a tribute like that, it feels sort of tawdry. But the, um, in the aftermath of, of the elections, I think the, the Democratic caucus in the Senate is two? Two. Two. Uh, are lopsided – Supermajorities like that ultimately unhealthy. Do you think for the state? Uh, yeah, I, I, I will. I will say this. Yes, I, I do. I think um, when when things get so far out of balance, uh, you know, I think back to my first term, my first two years in the Senate, when the smoke cleared on election night, in 2014, we were tied, 17 to 17. And we achieved a majority by virtue of one senator from Raleigh County uh, making the decision to change his uh, political registration from Democrat to Republican. And we ended up with an 1816 majority. And looking back over the last 10 years, uh, I will say that, you know, I, I think we were I think we were very good then. We uh, because. You you had to you had to have consensus to get things passed across party lines, and the numbers were such that if you had one member of the majority caucus who said I can't agree or go along with a particular question, it failed on a 17-17 tie. So uh, I I do think there is uh, a danger in having things be so one-sided. Uh, the you know I. My whole career in the House of Delegates, I served in the minority, never had the opportunity to be in the majority. And uh, But with the leadership that was there over those years, uh, Chuck Chambers was speaker first and then Bob Kiss, you know, I, I always did feel as if when I had something important I felt I had to say on a question that they listened. And, uh, you, you, boy, you have to do that. And, on and that it's... On it's, that note, Charlie, all, i got to jump in voices. because we're just about out of time. I want to thank you very much for yours and all of your appearances on this program over the years as well. They've always been very informative. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, Rob, Charlie. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving to all of you and to all your listeners. Right back at you. Senator Charles Trump at 9 o'clock. This is Talk Radio, WRNR Martinsburg and TV 10. Back with more after these. Oh.